I'm very pleased to be invited to speak at this year's Porrick Column Gathering. My warm thanks to Martin Morris and colleagues for the invitation. These are somewhat strange circumstances, but it is a delight to be here virtually, uh, and I look forward to joining in person in future years. It's a particular delight to be in the context of those of you who are interested in the work of Pori Cullum. I've begun a joint biography of Mary and Pori Cullum and very much look forward, not just today, but in the months and years ahead to receiving your comments, uh, your suggestions, your recommendations. That's especially true in the case of the Pori Cullum family. And from the outset, I'd like to express my sincere condolences on the sad recent death of Kleena Nihulavon and recognize how great a loss that is for her family, friends, and indeed the wider cultural sector in Ireland. The portrait I've chosen to begin today comes from a photograph taken by Con Constantine Curran a friend and contemporary of Pori Columns. It's available in UCD Digital Library, which is very proud to host a significant portion of Con Curran's photographic archive. And this photograph we think is taken around 1905 and captures, I hope, the, both the pensive, uh, but also I think the very compelling presence of the young Pori Column. I'd also like from the outset to express my thanks to Helen Salterer, granddaughter of Con Curran, for her continuing interest in this project, and also to Vivian Igo, I know a long-standing supporter of Pori Cullum and his legacy, and also my American Irish friend, Maury Murphy. Uh, all three of them continue to send me really important resources and I'm really grateful to them for their affirmation at this stage in the project. Moving to the epigraph that I chose for today's talk, Column, The Only Sane Man in Irish Literature. The context of this comes from the New York Times in August 1958. It's a review by Frank O'Connor of Mary and Pori Cullum's fine biography of Joyce entitled Our Friend James Joyce. And again, my thanks to my colleague Fran O'Rourke and UCD uh, for sending this reference to me. The lines memorably uh, end where uh, Frank O'Connor is quoting uh, from a comment by George Russell A.E. to Frank O'Connor, you're mad, I'm mad, Yeats is mad, Joyce is as mad as a hatter, Cullum is the only sane man in Irish literature. Well as, well as reproducing that same comment, uh, Frank O'Connor also makes an important parallel uh, earlier in his review and one of particular interest, I know, to a Longford audience. And that's the long-standing parallel drawn between Pori Cullum and the earlier work um, of Goldsmith. And O'Connor writes, when Mr. Cullum writes of Joyce's admiration of Goldsmith, he seems to be describing himself. He was unassuming, Joyce went on to say, praising Goldsmith for personal qualities. That topic of a man, Pori Cullum, who was unassuming, is one of the many aspects of Cullum that piqued my interest in embarking on this project. Another feature is, um, and indeed was, his generosity his generosity throughout his career in sponsoring the reputations of others, using the intellectual and cultural authority that he himself had gathered in Dublin and later in New York and America to support the reputations of those less fortunate. And that's why the opening topic I'd like to explore today is to do with this role of Pori Cullum as mediator, as supporter, most famously of James Joyce, and I'll come back to that at the end of my talk, but indeed a generosity that was extended to many others. 
And in seeking to tell that story, I'm also aiming to move beyond the more traditional mode of Irish biographical studies, which is to focus on the quote unquote great man. And what does it mean to move beyond that form of biography, a shift I think we're seeing in lots of really interesting ways in our current time towards collective biography, towards possibographical studies. Well, to do that, I think also involves then looking at networks, at mediators, at brokers, not just historically, but how those forces work in the contemporary to put that more directly, how literary reputations are made, how they're shaped, how they're endangered, and how they survive. So in exploring that, I'll be looking in particular today at Pori Cullum's networks in early 20th century Dublin life. And that's going to allow me to spend some time looking at his early career as a poet, but also his early career as a dramatist and I'm going to focus on the play, The Land in particular. And then towards the end, coming back to that larger question of collective biography, but also networks of influence, of connection, of support. I look briefly at his lifelong friendship uh, with James Joyce. To seek to capture imaginatively the literary life of Dublin, in early 20th century is a large task, but I have some good resources at my disposal, not least the wonderful memoir by Mary Cullum, Life and the Dream, which was published in New York by Doubleday in 1947. And later following Mary's death, Porrick published a version with Dalman Press in Dublin in 1966. And this is Mary, then Mary Maguire, writing about her recollections of Dublin in the early 20th century. Dublin was a small city, the suburbs stretched out to a distance, but the centre, the old part of the city, were circumscribed and bristled with movements of various kinds, dramatic, artistic, educational. There were movements for the restoration of the Irish language, for reviving native arts and crafts, for preserving ancient ruins, for resurrecting native costume, an array of political movements. Here too were the theatres and the tea rooms and pubs, which corresponded to the cafe life of the continental city. In the centre too were the headquarters of the clubs and societies, some at war with each other, but all exciting and somehow focused towards one end, a renaissance. Between Abbey Street and College Green, a five minutes walk, one could meet every person of importance in the life of the city at a certain time in the afternoon. That same sense of the vibrancy of Dublin, of its intellectual life, continues in Pori Cullum's later recollections. In particular, his memories of what he called the young and men young men and women belonging to the political cultural clubs in Dublin of the time. It's an interesting term, political cultural clubs, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But Pori Cullum also recollects in many places in his writings on the places that made this possible. And here, just want to give us one example, um, his very vivid evocation of the importance of the National Library. He makes the point uh, in Our Friend James Joyce, which was co-written by Porrick and Mary, he makes the point, I think a useful reminder, that those buildings, the National Library and the National Museum, had only been in existence <clears throat> a generation uh, when he, the young Pori Cullum, young Mary Maguire, young James Joyce were frequenting them. Uh, and it's a passage I particularly enjoy as we celebrate, you know, with great joy and relief at the reopening of those buildings this week. Young people have no aptitude for evaluating what is theirs by inheritance. They step into it. That is all they know about it. So it was with the students and the casual intellectuals among the youth of Dublin. 
In the reading room of the National Library, they had a handsome place in which to read, to view each other, to converse in the portico below, to make the encounters that permitted couples to walk together to their quarters. The library thus provided something of a social life as well as an intellectual life. It was hospitable. That term hospitality is one I'm going to continue to invoke for the, the mind uh, and ambition of the young Pori Cullum. And also I think it's notable here, the way a glimpse of again, an important biographical feature of Cullum himself, which is that he received much less formal education than Mary Maguire Cullum or James Joyce, uh, as someone who didn't attend a formal university in these early years of the 20th century. Moving then to his early poetry, uh, a key moment in Parry Cullum's formation in his publishing career was the selection of five of his poems by George Russell A.E. for this collection, New Songs. And even the title page again gives us a sense of the circles in which he was moving in these early years of the century. Poems included by Russell from Ava Gore Booth, Thomas Kohler, Alice Milligan, Susan Mitchell, Seamus O'Sullivan, James Starkey, George Roberts and Ella Young. And again, it's striking how some of these reputations have survived better than others. We can see here the five poems from the young column, which A.E. selected. Three of them would go on to become really canons, uh, or classics, I should say, uh, of, 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 um, of, of uh, Pori Cullum's Ouvre. That's, of course, The Plower, A Drover, a portrait which would soon be retitled by him as Poor Scholar of the Forties and then two less well-known poems, Dream and Shadow and The Bells. So a drover, as I say, one of the best loved of Porikon's poems. To me, of the pastures from wet hills by the sea, through Leitrim and Longford go my cattle and me. I hear in the darkness, they're slipping and breathing, I named them the byways there to pass without heeding. Then the wet winding roads, brown bogs with black water, and my thoughts on white ships and the King of Spain's daughter. And those wonderful closing lines, I will bring you my kind where there's grass to the knee, but you'll think of scant croppings, harsh with salt of the sea. The collection New Songs included as a frontispiece a woodcut by Jack B. Yeats, indeed uh, inspired by Cullum's poem and also called The Plower. But it also includes this little poem, uh, much less well known, uh, and I think a useful reminder from the outset really of, of a more sombre voice in the poetic work of Pori Cullum. Ring little bells, tormenting tunes, your peal calls off my scoffs and sneers. Lo, all the bitter words I've said, come back and sting me while you ring. O forest bird, forget your songs, no more build up with these a world of swaying trees and falling streams. O forest bird with gold hairs bound, build up no more your forest world with song caught from the trees and streams. Soon afterwards, uh, Cullum would publish his own first collection, Wild Earth, The Book of Births, published in 1907, and significantly, we can see, dedicated to George Russell, who fostered me. We can see here how he revises uh, and shortens the poem I've just read, O Forest Bird. I think one of the very simple, but also very evocative lyrics of his early career. Column 
and indeed Mary Maguire would move in very rich, very stimulating, sometimes indeed divided literary circles. Um, some years later, for example, in their work on the Irish Review, they would come into significant contact with Thomas Macdonough, uh, Joseph Mary Plunkett and others. But I think a glimpse into some of the other circles in which Pori Cullum moves can be seen just very simply from the play cast of his early plays. And we can see here how the Saxon Shilling was first produced in May 1903 by the Daughters of Erin in Nini and Heron, most famously associated with Maud Gan, um, but also with Marna Cooley. Um, or Maura Mary Walker and uh, Sarah Allgood and others. And Inini Naheran were themselves a key network in enabling uh, the young Pa'ori Cullum to come to theatrical attention. So, for example, uh, his very first play, Children of Lear, was staged by um, Anini Naheran. And I particularly wanted to include um, this slide here uh, because one can only begin to speculate uh, the pride this must have brought um, to the young Porrick and indeed to his family and um, to have his one act play Children of Lear published in the Irish Weekly Independent on the 14th of September 1901 when he was still only 19 years of age. He would become 20 only the following uh, December. Again, you'll notice here, he published it using the earlier spelling of the family name um, that, that he used on some other occasions, Colum, C-O-L-L-U-M-B, and indeed published in it in a sort of pseudonym uh, using Joseph as his first um, name. It's a very powerful, I think very poignant um, rendition of the Children of Lear, and one can really see the theatrical quality uh, of the young column, even in, in this early publication. Um, and one can also glimpse, I think, some of the biographical detail. Um, as you know, the Children of Lear are doomed by their evil stepmother, uh, and the lines in which the children talk about and um, their dead mother, I think is especially poignant when one thinks, of course, of the young Pori Cullum having lost his own mother some years before. Fanul asks, who are we? A sorrow to our father and a pain, for we remind him of a love long lost. And <coughs> A responds, long lost, but not forgotten. The memory of our mother is dearer now to him than Ava's presence. That first play then, Children of Lear, published in the Irish Independent, was sent by the young Cullum to Anina Naharan for staging and their warmth of reaction and their hospitality was a key factor in encouraging him in this early stage of his career. Returning then to the play casts, uh, they first produced his play, The Saxon Shilling, in May 1903 in the Bonba Hall in Dublin. And the production of that play was itself a form of political flashpoint. It was intended that it would be produced by the Irish National Theatre Society, the body later and now, of course, better known as the Abbey Theatre, but it would seem, and there are various opinions uh, about this down through the years, but it would seem that Willie Fay feared government reprisal for a play that was about uh, a character taking the quote, Saxon shilling um, and becoming a soldier. Um, <clears throat> and Willie Fay reneged on producing it, a, de a decision that was heavily criticized by Maud Gan and Arthur Griffith uh, and they promptly left the society uh, again with repercussions uh, for many years to come. And the play was produced by Inini Naharan. And the second play, Broken Soil, first produced in 1903 by the Irish National Theatre Society, 
uh, is a play where we can see the great influence of Ibsen and I Ibsen's Irish disciple, Edward Martin, on the young Colum. But we can see here how Colum's plays are, are being uh, performed by some of the key actors of the period, by Frank Fay, PJ Kelly, Sarah Allgood, Honor Lavelle, the stage name of Helen Laird, um, later wife of, of Con Curran, and Maura Nicooley, whose wonderful memoir, The Splendid Years, which is still in print uh, and warmly recommended for anybody interested in this period, would feature a foreword by her longtime friend, Pori Cullum. Here we see in the uh, play cast for the land, uh, William Fay, Sarah Allgood again, Frank Fay, uh, and directed by William Fay, and the later play Thomas Muskery, uh, featuring names like Fred O'Donovan, um, Kerrigan, Sarah Allgood, um, and so forth, and first produced in the Abbey Theatre Dublin. There is a sort of play, I suppose, um, and certainly drama going on behind the scenes there um, that I'll come back to in a moment. But I just want to spend a few moments talking about the play, The Land, first produced in June 1905. I very much agree with um, the great uh, theatre critic Chris Murray, uh, my colleague from University College Dublin, and that this is a uh, unjustly neglected play uh, and a play that really deserves more critical attention. Uh, as I was preparing for today, it occurred to me that it would make for a really interesting staged reading um, if, or maybe even a performance, but certainly a staged reading uh, for future um, meetings um, of, this, of this gathering, because it's a play I think that continues to have a lot of resonances in our own time. The setting of the play is significant. It's set on um, the day in which many Irish tenant farmers were enabled for the first time to purchase their land uh, because of the Wyndham Land Act. And the play reverberates around two families. The head of one is Martin Cosker, who's a strong farmer, uh, a very ambitious man. And the second family, the father is a man called Martin Doris, who's a more reflective, um, even poor scholar figure, a more reflective intellectual man uh, and less um, economically successful and than his Cosker neighbor. When the play opens, Martin Cosker is refusing to divide his farm um, uh, uh, despite the requests of, of his son, Matt, who wants a holding of his own so that he can marry Ellen Duras, a son of the other, uh, or excuse me, daughter um, of the other family. And the alternative that Matt and Ellen face is emigration. Uh, here we see the beautiful um, uh, frontispiece. Uh, I'm lucky enough to own uh, a copy of it, which I really treasure uh, in the very beautiful Monsell series. Uh, the frontispiece of, of the land. <clears throat> and here is just one example of, of where the play engages in, in a very interesting way and um, with a contemporary theme of emigration. As Maureen Murphy's scholarship has shown us, um, the history of Irish immigration is quite distinctive um, to that of other countries to the United States by being distinguished by long patterns of emigration by single women, um, often indeed groups of women who were often then sponsored uh, by older women from their community. And Pori Cullum captures that really well in the scene where a number of girls kind of come into the action and cha um, who are chattering really excitedly uh, uh, about emigration and they're exhorting Ellen uh, to come with them. Isn't it a life altogether different from this life that we've been longing for, to be doing other work and to be meeting strange people, and instead of bare roads and market towns, to be seeing streets and crowds and theatres? And then Ellen responds passionately, oh, what do you know about streets and theatres? You've only heard them 
they're finer than anything you could say. I think it would be interesting in a production of the play that how one hears Ellen saying this, is she saying it passionately herself because she's been caught up um, in the dream of emigration or does she have a more realistic uh, attitude realizing that the world ahead is not going to be as simple um, or as positive as the dream uh, that the young girls are inhabiting. And that similar question about the nature of the dream and how it will realize itself in the future uh, can be seen in the closing words of the play where Cornelius, uh, the son who has chosen to stay at home, is trying to encourage his father to join in a rebuke against those like Matt and Ellen who are going to emigrate. Aren't they foolish to be going away like that father and me at the mouth of the good times? And there is a way in which the father, torn between the fates of his children, refuses uh, to shake his head. And even in this very short and, and in ways quite direct play, Colm is staging such a long-standing debate in Irish culture, you know, about emigration. Is it right to go um, or is it right to stay? And Cornelius, who for much of the play has been a sort of shadowy figure, is now having his moment um, in, in the lights where he delivers himself uh, a sort of visionary statement to the men of Ballyhill Duff. Do you ever think of the Irish nation that is waiting all this time to be born? But again, the theatrical mastery of Colin is that he emphasizes that Cornelius is seen to be struggling with words. So it's not uh, a vision that's delivered eloquently or straightforwardly. It's again a question about what the future will bring. And of course, a question that we answer differently in 2021, because there's a way in which we know um, the ending to the play. We're less sure perhaps of the ending of Cornelius and people like him. One of the, the theatrical sources of the time, the reviews of the plays, show us that at the end of the play, Cullum was called on stage and received a tremendous ovation. And in response to imperative demands for a speech, he briefly returned thanks and said, to his mind, the function of the theatre was to put before the public strong, great types and so contribute to the evolution in Ireland of a great democracy. That comment was itself quite a brave one um, because in doing this, I think Cullum was nailing his colours very firmly to the mast uh, and, and that is signalling his deep belief in the role of the Abbey Theatre as a political force, as contributing to the evolution in Ireland of a great democracy. Because behind the scenes in June 1905, uh, a growing conflict was emerging and, and one in which Colm would, would become very deeply um, embroiled. And the context in brief was that Annie Horniman, uh, the English supporter of the Abbey Theatre, had now offered the theatre a significantly larger endowment, uh, which would allow the payment of professional salaries but one of the conditions was that the governance of the Abbey Theatre would change from the much more democratic structure of the Irish National Theatre Society uh, and would change to a triumvirate of directors, preferably for Orniman, Yeats, Gregory and Singh. It's clear from Cullum's letters at this time that he was appalled at the concept of this change of governance and also could see uh, quite far-seeingly um, that it would cause a disaster, a disaster split. Uh, apologies, the uh, image of the letter isn't very clear here, but you can see his very clear appeal to Yeats in a letter dated the 3rd of June, 1905. I appeal to you, I earnestly appeal to you to take steps to reunite the group. 
please write to me at once and let me know what steps you're about to take. I'm currently involved in archival work um, about this moment um, in Irish theatrical history and its significance for Column biographically. Um, and that involved spending some time in the Berg Library um, just before the shutdown. So this is very much work in progress and I'm looking forward to getting back to the Berg and to the National Library to continue the research in this. But just in some of the early findings um, that that I'm encountering along the way, and perhaps my own bias is, is going to be very clear here, but one can see quite a condescension uh, towards Colum um, in the reactions of, of the more powerful figures of the day. Writing to Yeats, Singh um, said, somewhat cruel comment, I think, in August 1905, Colum seems never to know his own mind. The fate often of the peacemaker, of course, can be to be seen as indecisive. And I, I kind of find it's quite suggestive to think of Singh on the Great Blasket in August 1905, again, deeply embroiled in theatrical politics. Um, writing back to Singh in January 1906, Yeats said, I strongly advise you to concede nothing. A rival theatre would only show the power of ours. Um, Cullum will be chaos without us and his actors chaos without Faye. Also very uh, increasingly bitter comments about Cullum from Gregory to Singh. What a poor creature he is and comments throughout Gregory's correspondence suggesting that Colm is being ungrateful. And a very strong comment from her directly to Colm in January 1906. You may spare a few hours before making a decision that will, I think, affect your work and your life. Um, and I think in many ways Colm's decision did. The decision he made was to resign from the Theatre Society and in um, this letter in February 1906 he very directly pinpoints the difference of vision um, between himself and those who resigned from the society at this point to create a rival group, the Theatre of Ireland, the difference between their vision uh, and that of Gregory and Yeats. And it was, in a way, the difference between a vision of the collective and uh, a vision of individuals. Uh, in this letter in February 1906, he quotes back to Yeats uh, a clause from Lady Gregory's letter. Lady Gregory says, the theatre was given to Mr Yeats to carry out his dramatic projects. Cullen continues, this is disclaiming the notion that the Abbey Theatre is the theatre of a society aimed at the creation of a national drama. It is altogether a personal adventure in, in Gregory's view, whereas Cullen goes on to say, I am developing ideas that may be altogether opposed to yours. I am still young enough to believe in a movement that will express itself in drama and from this out, it will be my study to get in touch with the life and ideas that underlie that movement and to turn them into personal experience. I shall work with any society that has the aims of the society to which we first belonged. I feel the situation very keenly. I may develop ideas opposed to yours, but I shall always be proud of being a contemporary to you and W. G. Fay, I owe much as a dramatist. I wanted to read those words in some detail because it's worth remembering that Conum is not long past his 24th uh, birthday. There's a bravery there, um, there's a dignity there that I think is in striking contrast to the, you know, uh, perceived indecisiveness. I mean, this is a young man who was trying uh, his best to keep the movement together, but it's also a man who was following um, the power of democratic principles. 
But I do think and would look forward to comments uh, later in any discussion. Uh, I do think it's a decision that cost him and um, that would affect uh, his later work in life. And it is striking that his theatrical work would prove um, in his overall career uh, to be um, a much more minor part. And I think that's really regrettable because again, I join Chris Murray in saying that we can see in Cullum's early drama in plays in particular, like The Land, a really powerful lineage uh, concerning the significance of land and emigration as themes. Uh, and that lineage would go forward to playwrights like John B. Keane, Brian Friel, um, and also Marina Carr. And I think they're interesting new ways of thinking about that lineage um, of Irish theatre when one puts Colm back into the equation. Just checking on time here for the, the last uh, five to 10 minutes. I'm just going to finish with some closing remarks about his most, I suppose, famous literary friendship. Uh, and that is his friendship with James Joyce. And it's wonderfully described in um, the joint um, biography uh, of Joyce, uh, authored by Mary and Pori Cullum, our friend James Joyce. First published in 1958, soon after Mary's death uh, and completed during the, the, the period of time of her illness. Uh, and again, I think it's quite moving um, to read both the writing of the biography and its publication uh, in their own um, context of loss. Um, I'll just in the closing minutes choose what, uh, a moment from the early years as recollected by Pori Cullum and then the later years. Um, he writes again, I think, in continuing eye for the individual in the larger um, uh, context where he says that um, there was always an interest in character in Dublin, an interest that was present in all of the coteries that the Dublin of the turn of the century composed himself itself into. A character's doings and sayings would be repeated from coterie to coterie, losing nothing in drama or humour in the repetition. So again, his eye always for the individual in the larger grouping. When I first met James Joyce in 1901 or early 1902, he was beginning to emerge as a Dublin character. Already there was a legend about him. Their first meeting took place uh, at one of uh, Augusta Gregory's evening parties where Cullum noticed two young men sitting in the corner. I do not remember that Joyce entered the conversation that evening. He and Gogarty sat apart near the door as if they did not quite belong at the gathering. And that sharp eye for detail continues as Cullum recollects soon afterwards um, introducing himself to the young Joyce. Uh, as they were both leaving the National Library reading room uh, one evening, he says, as Joyce went through the turnstile on his way out, I went through, through it too and spoke to him on the stairway. I think he took my approach as an act of homage. It was and was willing to go along with me conversationally. And that perspicacity, um, but also a fondness continues throughout Cullum's portrait of the, you know, somewhat precocious uh, young James Joyce. And he goes on in this recollection um, to talk about their very first conversation as they walked along Kildare Street, along O'Connell Street and so forth, where Joyce at one stage in response to a question from Cullum uh, about the nationalist movement said, I distrust all enthusiasms. And Cullum's recollection of that conversation serves really to underline the differences between these two men. Uh, Cullum continues, it was natural to think, and I suppose I thought it, that a young man who distrusted all enthusiasms was a singular character. And for Joyce to say this in the Dublin of the day, 
was to set himself up as a heretic or schismatic, one who rifles the deposit of the faith. To us at that time, belonging to a movement meant fellowship, exhilaration. It meant moving away from the despondency of the generation before and toward a new national glory. Who would not be in such a movement? And it was animated by enthusiasm. I am trying to find a word for the way that the young man standing on that street corner said, I distrust all enthusiasms. It was not with any youthful bravado. It was rather like one giving a single veto after a tiring argument. And in a way, by choosing this episode, I myself am trying to find a way for the different path that these two uh, young men took. Uh, some of the detail hasn't translated uh, here in the slide. Let me go back and see if it works better this time. Uh, it hasn't, but here it's just a, a small and very partial example of the continuing ways in which Mary Cullum uh, and Porrick Joyce supported uh, the career of James Joyce at key moments um, of his life. Pori Cullum writing articles on Joyce as a dramatist as early as 1918, Mary Cullum reviewing Ulysses, the missing war there, um, in 1922 and 1923, Pori Cullum giving an introduction to Dubliners, I could even set this as a quiz question, an introduction to Dubliners in 1926 publishing in uh, The Road Round Ireland with an extended portrait of Joyce in 26. Mary Cullum writing about Joyce in her collection of criticism from these roots in 1937. Crucial timing, Pori Cullum reviewing Finnegan's Wake in 39. Mary Cullum writing about Joyce in a lot of detail in her memoir, Pori Cullum's introduction to exiles in 1951 and their publication of our friends James Joyce, it actually first appeared, completed in 57 and uh, published in 58. But the, the last um, uh, reference, the last meeting of the Columns who would meet the Joyces at a number of occasions through their lives and spent significant time in their company in Paris in the 1930s comes in this I think very moving description that Pori Column gives of the last time they see each other. I think it's set around um, 1938. There's a reference here um, to Joyce finishing, being on the last pages of Finnegan's Wake. But the Columns are going back to uh, America and the Joyces are staying in Europe. I knew all the time we were talking that for Joyce, this was a real separation. In Europe, a feeling of desperation was rising. We were going from a continent filled with misgivings and dangers to a continent where violence and stupidity were threatening the were not threatening the people. And Joy said this in his well wishing. <clears throat> it made his well wishing the more earnest. He was sad. He was lonely. He was resigned. He was here out of an old friendship. To the surprise of the columns, Joyce and Nora had come to the train and to see them off. It was a very different leave taking from others we had had from him in the earlier Paris years when he was the genial Dublin man, happy with family and friends. Goodbye, Joyce, luck to Finnegan's wake, we called. As the train began to move, Joyce, stumbling on a bit, said to my wife, We don't want you to go, but anyhow, you'll be safe in America. To finish my short talk um, uh, about Pori Cullum, Cullum in networks, uh, in his connections, his generosity, I, I just want to draw from a recollection he gave in the Dublin Magazine um, between 1949 and uh, 1950, where um, he wrote, uh, taking on board a quote from Plutarch, um, he's, uh, he quotes from Plutarch and says, my conclusion will be a comment, uh, and two uh, words missing here from my slide, Plutarch lied, the great thing cannot be altogether the creation of one great man. 
Colm here is alluding uh, to Plutarch's uh, Lives, the series of 48 biographies of famous men which Plutarch assembled. And Colm here is again, I think very characteristically refusing a history uh, of, of single men and indeed refusing a notion of history that the great thing is the creation of a great man or woman. When Willie Fay wrote about the foundation of the theatre, when Lady Gregory wrote about it, they were on the side of Plutarch, the side of the historian who was there to tell us that the great man, the hero, does everything. And instead, Colm emphasises, there are certain imponderables working through minor men and women that instigate great men to give form and scope to what the others are reaching towards. Without these imponderables, without the fermenting but unkeyed up minds surrounding the great man, no dominating work is ever achieved. Those fermenting minds were present in the movement that created a national theatre for Ireland. My recollection assures me that behind the writers and players was a national feeling that manifested itself through the young men and women belonging to the political cultural clubs in the Dublin of the time. It was they who gave the project spirit and the breath of life. So maybe my own closing reflection is we need a, a third way of writing history one that isn't just about great men or women, but on the other hand, one that doesn't dismiss uh, the less well-known characters as minor, which is the very modest term uh, that Pori Cullum is suggesting, but instead that we can find a way of telling a more populated, richer collective history in which the young men and women, young man and woman, Pori Cullum and Mary Maguire Cullum would play a key part. Thanks so much for your attention, uh, for staying with me uh, in this talk today, and I look forward to the rest of the gathering.